This is our own version of a doubleheader. Tom Whalen's talk and a book signing followed by the Red Sox, as has been put here, in a do or die game at, Cam at Camden Yards. In fact, the last baseball game I went to was at Camden Yards. Um, at the MHS, we try to use as many lenses, lenses as possible to look at American history and Massachusetts history. And we're, what we're about to hear is a wonderful example of how we can do this. And of course, though we're, we are the State Historical Society, we're also part of the Fenway, and we're, we very much identify uh, with the Fenway in our neighborhood. So events over at, at Fenway Park are part of the neighborhood lore. We've been around since 1791, and at this site since 1899. So we are here to greet 13 years later uh, in 1912, Fenway Park when it opened, and the Red Sox in their, in their first season. And of course, uh, uh, baseball's first dynasty was born, which we'll hear about. So here to tell you about when the Red Sox ruled is another neighbor from down the street at, at BU, Tom Whalen. He's an associate professor of social science at Boston University and the author of Kennedy versus Lodge, A Higher Purpose and Dynasty's End. He's been a political commentator for the New York Times, abcnews.com, the Wall Street Journal, the Boston Globe, USA Today, the LA Times, and Politico. So why don't we all welcome Tom Whale. Thank you. I'm delighted to be here. Um, this is a special night uh, for all of us. The Red Sox, hopefully they'll win, but you never know. You never know if these guys. Um, but what I want to focus on is a happier time, shall we say, so this nail biting that's going on right now. And that is really the first modern baseball dynasty in our nation. And when I say modern, I want to be specific with my terms here. The modern era really begins in baseball from 1903 onward, because 1903, what happened in baseball? the first World Series, where the American and National Leagues who are battling one another come together and have a championship round, the World Series, best of seven. And there was only two times since 1903 when, of course, they didn't have a World Series. One was in 1904, because the Giants didn't want to play the Red Sox. And those New Yorkers, what do you know? <laughs> and what was the other time? The strike year, 1994. So, you know, that's an amazing um, round of consistency. So the Red Sox, that's one time when they can say they bested the Yankees. They were the first dynasty. And as we'll see, they laid, <coughs> unfortunately, the foundation for the great Yankee dynasty of the 20th century. But in looking at this book, I found that it wasn't just this dynasty that went from 1912 to 1918 that was of real interest. That if you look at Boston at this point in history, that its relationship with professional baseball goes further back, much further back. And it really, the story begins back in 1871. And that's when a man by the name of Ivers Adams, he was a local businessman here in Boston, he decided to bring professional baseball to Beantown. And who did he get? Well, he didn't get just any team to come here. He got the defunct Cincinnati Red Stockings. And that was the first professional team in our nation's history. And they basically went bankrupt at the end of the 1870, 1870 uh, season. And Adams was able to bring them pretty much lock, stock, and barrel to Boston. And he also co-opted the name. The Cincinnati Red Stockings became the Boston Red Stockings. And the original Boston Red Stockings, follow me, became the Bean Eaters, the Doves, and then eventually the Boston Braves, then the Milwaukee Braves, then the Atlanta Braves. And that team is the largest, or the, excuse me, the longest continuously run professional sports franchise on the North American continent. So that's, and it all started here in Boston, in Beantown. Now, the Red Stockings were an amazingly successful team. They were in the first organized professional baseball league called the National Association from 1871 to 1875. And they won four championships. 
And they won them by astonishingly, you know, we're talking 20, 30 game margins here. And they were so good that a different league had to be formed because there was no pennant races. They wanted greater competition because fans weren't coming up enough. So they formed the National League in 1876. And the Red Stockings became a charter member of that league. And even then, many of their players went to other teams in the National League. They, were, they signed elsewhere. They still dominated competition over the next quarter century. They won eight pennants in roughly 24 years. So that's a third of the pennants. And as one of their players put it, the great Al Spaulding, a great pitcher, later founded the sporting goods empire, Spaulding, he said, just as Boston should be known as the cradle of liberty, it should also be known as the cradle of baseball. And it really, truly was the cradle of baseball. What New York was to baseball in the 20th century, Boston surely was in the 19th century. And there was a number of great players, including Al Spaulding, uh, Hugh Duffy, for example. He uh, hit, I believe, 440 one year for the uh, Bean Eaters in the 1890s. I think that's still the highest recorded batting average in baseball history. And also there was uh, this fellow, Michael King Kelly. And I like to think of him as the original five-tool ball player. He could do it all. He could throw, hit, hit with power, steal. And he was quite a character. He's considered the greatest baseball player of the 19th century. The Babe Ruth of the 19th century, really. And like the Babe, he liked to have fun. He liked to drink a lot. And he liked to spend money. And they once asked him, uh, do you drink during games? And he paused and he said, depends on how long the game is. <laughs> and you know, just take a look at him. He has that kind of swagger. They said he could swagger, you know, just you know, walking across the streets and you know, everyone took to him just like Babe Ruth. He was a very popular member of uh, the Boston team. But alas, his life was cut short by pneumonia. He died, I believe, at the age of 34 in um, the Boston City Hospital back, I think it was in 1896. So he had a very short but life, but you know, he is part of that famous song, Slide, Kelly, Slide. Now, the Boston Bean Eaters, because that's what their name was, they transformed from the Red Stockings to the Bean Eaters by the 1890s. As I said, they were a phenomenally successful team, but by the turn of the century, things began to go awry. And the main reason it went awry for the Bean Eaters was this man, Byron Ban Johnson. And Mr. Johnson, take a good look at him, he was, um, how should we say, a man of large appetites. But he had even larger ambitions. And he had it in his mind to transform what was a minor league called the Western League, primarily stationed in the Midwest, and make it into a competitor to the National League. And the National League, um, at the end of the 19th century, it was kind of in a state of doldrums because it was associated, let's say, with the uh, not so good elements of Boston society and urban centers around the country, <coughs> the Irish. And what Johnson wanted to do, and what the founders of the American League wanted to do, was to appeal to the growing middle class of America. Give them clean, decent family fun at a reasonable price, without having to worry about a beer bottle being thrown at your head. And he finds, founds the American League in 1901. And initially, Boston was not slated to have a franchise because it was considered thoroughly a National League town. But this is where it gets really interesting, because when you think of Boston, what three things do you think of? Sports, politics, revenge. <laughs> and it turns out that the National League tried to sabotage Johnson's efforts in putting in a uh, American League team in New York, which became the Yankees, of course. So to get even with the National League, he decided, oh yeah, well, I'll put a team in Boston. And not only that, when he put the team in Boston, they stole a number of players from the Bean Eaters, their best players, including Jimmy Collins, the Hall of Fame third baseman, who um, became player manager of the Red Sox. And they didn't just stop with raiding the Bean Eaters of their players, they also got other National League stars like, oh, the greatest 
uh, victory leader in terms of pitching, Cy Young. Got, them, got him from St. Louis. And note, BA. What does it stand for? The Boston Americans. And, you know, there's kind of a myth out there that the original uh, team was known as the Pilgrims. That wasn't the case. They were known as the Americans for obvious reasons, belonging to the American, American League. And with Cy Young and Jimmy Collins and a number of former Bean Eaters on the team, they were instant pennant contenders. And unfortunately for the Bean Eaters, they went downhill. And they would win only two more pennants over the next roughly half century before eventually abandoning Boston altogether for Milwaukee in 1953. So this was a Red Sox town from the beginning. And to help attract fans, they lowered the price of beer. And they also lowered the price of the tickets. So they had all these, these things going for them. And the fans took to this team almost immediately. And of course, the Irish in Boston, the Irish love a good game, still do. And I can say that from experience. And they had a number of uh, interesting fans, but no, no one was more notorious than the famous Michael Nuff said McGreevy, who owned a tavern on, uh, I believe it was Columbus Avenue. And uh, he used to, uh, invite people over to his bar. They'd have all these great sports battles, debates about things. And whenever it got out of hand, he'd slam his hand on the, uh, the bar and said, enough said. And that's where he got his uh, nickname, enough said McGreevy. And he was actually a pretty good athlete. He was an expert handball player. He founded the L Street Brownies of South Boston. And he used to uh, go to spring training with uh, the Red Sox. And he used to take um, fielding practice with them. He put on a uniform and they let him play. One time, a minor league owner was so impressed that he tried to sign him to a contract. And he said, well, sir, you've been handed a lemon. I'm a bar owner. <laughs> so, enough said McGreevy and the fan base, well, they really supported this early version of the Red Sox. And they had much to uh, root for, frankly. In 1903, they won the American League pennant. And they went into the World Series, the first World Series, against the Pittsburgh Pirates. And this is a picture. This is where they played the Huntington Avenue grounds, which is not too far from here. And this is after one of the games. You see the uh, fans going on the field when you can do such a thing. And they won this uh, World Series um, rather handily, although there were rumors that uh, <coughs> certain games were thrown by the Pirates. Uh, to the Red Sox, but the fact that they won the first world championship, I think this cemented the relationship with the Boston fandom here. And they would repeat as American League champions in 1904. But after 1904, things for the Red Sox, or soon to be Red Sox, began to deteriorate. And they kind of fell into the lower ranks of the league. And a lot of this had to do with their new owner, John I. Taylor. And the Taylor family, uh, does anyone know their significance here in Boston? What, what are they most known for? They own the Globe. And General Taylor, uh, Charles Taylor, he founded and owned the Globe. And he had a problem in the early 20th century. He had this son. And the son, how to put it politely, he was a complete, utter screw-up. He spent all his youth hanging around in bars, getting drunk, going to parties. Didn't seem too serious a man, especially if you had you know, fought in the Civil War like his, like his father. What am I going to do with this kid? Well, he attends a lot of ball games. Aha! I'll buy him a professional baseball team. And the uh, Americans were available. So he bought the team. And John I. Taylor, uh, how should we say, uh, in his early years, his owner was like a wrecking ball. He ripped up the roster. He was like George Steinbrenner, interfering all the time with the manager. Jimmy Collins hated his guts, and he was the player manager. And unfortunately, Mr. Collins had to leave. He couldn't take it anymore. And he also, Taylor, he traded away Cy Young, probably costing him at least one pennant. But Mr. Taylor wasn't all bad in terms of what he contributed to the baseball scene. 
because he was the one who named the Americans, or renamed them, the Boston Red Sox. And this occurred after the 1907 season when the uh, Crosstown, then Boston Doves, gave up the red hosiery that they would wear for their home games. And he said, I'm going to grab the, that color and I'm going to grab the name Red Sox. So the Red Sox, in a sense, were reborn from the 19th century. And they've remained so ever since. Now, he also did something else that was of significant importance. He began to sign younger players. Players like Bill Carrigan, Trish Speaker, Joe Wood. So he put together the core of what would become the Red Sox dynasty from 1912 to 1918. And he also did something else. He was the man behind the building of Fenway Park. And this is an interesting story in and of itself. Now, if you look back into the history of Boston, we all know about the Olmstead necklace, correct? What is the Olmstead necklace? I feel like I'm in class. <laughs> it's, it was the dream of linking Boston from South Boston to the Back Bay with a series of parks and waterways. And initially, it was um, slated that the Fens area, the Fenway, which was really just swampland, it would be drained, fixed up, and it would be made into beautiful parkland for all Bostonians to enjoy. But it being Boston, things didn't go quite as planned. They probably ran out of money, political mischief, and so forth. So they had this kind of developed land, or semi-developed land, but what are you going to do with it? Because we're not going to make it into parklands. Well, the developers began to come, move in, and real estate people. People like, oh, the Taylor family. And they began to buy up huge swaths of property in the fence. But there was a problem. How do you get people to move to the Fenway area? I mean, this is still virgin territory for most people. Everyone thinks of the fens back then. Well, why would I you know, have a house or an apartment over a swamp? That's what it was, wasn't it? So they needed to build or have an attraction to draw people to this area of town. How about building a ballpark? And that's exactly what happened. And the Taylor family, they had what was known as the Fenway Realty Company. And basically, they sold, or John I. Taylor sold a piece of property in the Fenway to himself off of Jersey Street. And he built the park for, I believe, about $650,000, which back then was a fairly significant amount. But the idea here was to draw people into their other real estate holdings and make a lot of money. And I think it's safe to say that the Taylors made a lot of money off of this deal. And oh yes, the name Fenway Park. Well, we all think of it, well, you know, Fenway, it's in the Fenway. It makes sense why it would be called Fenway. Well, think about it at this angle. It was really corporate naming rights because the Taylors Real Estate Company was called the Fenway Realty Company. So it was this way to remind people coming through the turnstiles, you know, if you want um, an apartment, want a home in the area, well, go to the Fenway Realty Company. That's where you'll uh, be set up. So Fenway Park was built and 1912 it opened and initially in April uh, there was a exhibition game in early April against Harvard University. Snowflakes were falling and the park was still being finished off and the Red Sox beat the Crimson. I think it was 2-0. Uh, but opening day came on April 20th and this was against, appropriately enough, the New York Highlanders, soon to become the New York Yankees. And the game was won by the Red Sox in extra innings thanks to a game-winning hit by center fielder Tris Speaker. And there was much to celebrate here, but I also want to just back up to talk about ballparks in general in Boston and their significance. Because Fenway Park at the time was considered a modern, state-of-the-art facility. It was considered one of the best ballparks in the country, cutting edge. But before then, Boston had a number of interesting parks, and this is probably the most interesting. This was considered the greatest ballpark of the 19th century. This was the old South End Grounds, also known as the Grand Pavilion. And look, it had medieval-like spires. It was a beautiful ballpark, and everyone praised it across uh, the country. 
The only problem was it was made of wood. And one day a careless fan, you know, took a cigarette, threw it down, got between the boards in the, I believe it was in the grandstand, caught fire. And it wasn't just in caught fire to the ballpark, it took out 175 buildings in Boston. And eventually they rebuilt this park, but it was never quite the same venue. It was kind of run down, and eventually by the 1920s it was abandoned. And 1915 is uh, when the National League Braves, they moved uh, down the street from the Red Sox. Um, they played in Braves Field, which is now um, owned by Boston University. It's called Nickerson Field. So Boston had long-standing uh, ties to uh, the construction of new ballparks. That there was a number of ballparks in Boston. Um, from the 19th century onward. And that just underlies just how rabid the fandom was here in Boston from the very beginning. Now, getting back to opening day 1912, well, who was on hand to throw out the first pitch? Honey Fitz, John Honey Fitz Fitzgerald, the grandfather of John F. Kennedy. And of course, I always have to put in a reference to John F. Kennedy because I'm a Kennedy historian, so pardon me. But who is this young lady? That's a very young Rose Fitzgerald Kennedy. And she was also a tremendous baseball fan. In fact, Honey Fitz tried to buy the Red Sox. But our old friend Ban Johnson prevented him, put the kibosh on it, because he felt that Honey Fitz was not someone he could control. Later, uh, his son-in-law, the controversial Joseph P. Kennedy, also tried to buy the Red Sox. But for one reason or another, the deal fell through. But I can imagine if the Kennedys bought the Red Sox, there would have been um, no curse. I think we would have won a few World Series uh, before 2004. But I should also note that um, this photograph, until very recently, was thought to be opening day 1912. It was actually, someone identified it at the BPL as uh, Honey Fitz throwing out the ball at the old self um, grounds. But this, I think it makes an interesting shot, nevertheless, to show you that right here. Now, the 1912 season, this was the season that started the dynasty. And these two figures here, they were important on that to that 1912 uh, club. Uh, the figure on the left there, on, that is the player manager, Jake Stahl. And he was brought out of retirement. He was, played first base for the Red Sox and was their manager in 1912. And he was a banker from Chicago. And he only came out of retirement because he was offered a 10% ownership stake in the team. And I was just thinking, wow, I think Kurt Schilling would come back if they offered him a 10% stake these days. And the, the fellow next to him, well, that was the uh, Red Sox owner at the time, James McAleer. And he was really a Johnson crony. He was also a player in his day. He uh, was an outfielder for the National League. And among the star players, on that team that year was Tris Speaker, the great center fielder. And he hailed from Texas. And, you know, like Roger Clemens, he was very kind of boastful. And he considered himself a Confederate's Confederate. And he was quite open in his dislike of anyone who was not Anglo Saxon, i.e., white. And he hated Catholics. And this is not surprising, given the fact that he was a member of the Ku Klux Klan. But without a doubt, Tris Speaker, in my opinion, is the greatest player to ever don a Red Sox uniform. Greater than Ted Williams, because Tris Speaker was the complete ball player. He was a tremendous center fielder. And in 1912, he hit 383. And he stole over, I think it was 52 bases, which was a... Um, team record until Tommy Harper broke it in 1973. It drove in 90 runs and you know, played in impeccable center field. And he liked to play in, in center field, you know, right behind the shortstop and second baseman. And this was the dead ball era. And the baseballs back then, they were wound very tight, so they didn't get much distance. So it wasn't like a, the steroid era home run ball going out of the park by just kind of just checking your swing. So he was ideal given his speed for this dead ball era kind of play. And although he was by far the best everyday player on that Red Sox team, when you think 1912, you think of this man. And this was Tris Speaker's roommate, 
Smokey Joe Wood. And Smokey Joe Wood, well, he had the uh, career of all career years here. And I have some of his statistics here. 34 wins in 1912, 10 shutouts, 258 strikeouts. And also from, I believe, July 8th to, to September 15th that year, he basically had a 16-game winning streak. And included in that streak was an early September game against the great Walter Johnson of the Washington Senators. And he beat Johnson one to nothing. And it was a standing room only crowd. And he later went on to win three games in the postseason that year. So he was an amazing story. And he probably could have been one of the greatest pitchers of all time. But we'll talk about that in a few moments. But a little bit about his background. He was born in Missouri, and his family eventually settled in uh, Kansas. And to get to Kansas, I believe his family um, used a Conestoga wagon. So think about that. You know, he's, here he is in the 20th century, but you know, he was very familiar with the Conestoga wagon of the 19th century. It's pretty interesting. Now, he also, he also got his uh, start in professional baseball in a unique way. There was a, um, several teams out in the Midwest called the Bloomer Girls. They were professional women's baseball teams. And they would tour, they would visit the towns, take on the regulars and so forth. And they would hire a number of ringers of the opposite sex. And among them was a young Joe Wood. And as he liked to later say that he didn't need to put on a wig like some of the other fellows who were trying to uh, pass as women because he had a baby face. But he played, started playing baseball in a skirt, interestingly enough. Um, I'm just thinking if John Lackey did. But anyway, that's a, that's a different thought. Um, so behind Woods pitching and speakers hitting, there was no one really to contend with the Red Sox. They just put light years between themselves and the rest of the American League. And this is the 1912 uh, team pitcher. And I, it's a really interesting shot because you know, there's a little girl at the top of the shot, and that has been identified as Smokey Joe's little sister. And that team won, wait for it, 104 games that year. The same amount, if I recall, that the Red Sox were supposed to win this year with their great team. Oh, well. Now, they played the World Series that year against the New York Giants. Apparently, the New York Giants uh, screwed on their courage made amends for 1904, and decided to play the Red Sox after all. And this was a great World Series. And it went eight full games. And you ask, wait a minute, eight games? Well, back then, before they had lights, um, one of the games, um, they couldn't continue. It was a tie because they ran out of sunlight. So they had to add on another game. So this World Series had a tie game in it. And eventually, it was settled here in Boston at Fenway Park, a, basically a fog-ridden Fenway Park. And it went um, extra innings, as it usually does with New York teams, it seems here. And uh, it was won when this man made a very crucial error in the bottom of the 10th. He dropped a fly ball. And a crucial out, as it turned out, and this man's name is Fred Snodgrass. He was the Bill Buckner of the 1912 World Series. And I think he said at the time, you know, geez, I'm always going to be remembered for dropping the damn ball. And of course, when he died, you know, in the New York Times obituary, what do they say? Fred Snodgrass, the man who threw, you know, botched the 1912 World Series. So sorry, Buckner, but that's the way it's going to be for you. But the 1912 World Series, um, this captured the nation's attention. And as I said, this was the first step in what was to be baseball's first dynasty. And I should know from 1912 to 1918, the Red Sox win four World Series in seven years. And outside of the New York Yankees, no other team in baseball since has ever won that many world championships. But alas for that 1912 team, things deteriorated after those 104 victories the following year. Smokey Joe leads the list as to why it began to deteriorate. He hurt his arm. 
Initially, in spring training, he slipped on the grass and he hurt his uh, pitching thumb. And he tried to come back too soon and hurt his right pitching shoulder. He was never the same after that. He was never able to complete a full season. Even though at one point he led the league in ERA, earned run average, and he won 15 games, but he always pitched in extreme pain. He eventually, because the pain was so great, decided to um, turn in his pitcher's glove for a fielder's glove. He hooked up with the Cleveland Indians and became an outfielder. And he was a very good outfielder. In fact, he is a lifetime 283 hitter. He later went on to uh, coach Yale for several decades. Now, interestingly enough, Mr. Wood was also involved in another major, well, I should reason, I should say, as to why the Red Sox were unable to repeat in 1913 and 1914. The club had a bit of, um, well, it was factionalized. It was split down the middle. And it was split down by sectarian, for sectarian reasons. That the team was divided between the Protestant members and the Catholics. And the Protestant faction was known as the Masons. What a surprise. The Catholic faction was known as the Knights of Columbus. And who was leading the Protestant faction? Want to take a guess? Trish Speaker and Joe Wood, because they hated Catholics. That's just the way it was back then. If you weren't Protestant, you were under suspicion. And who led the uh, Catholic faction? Well, my favorite player of all time, Bill Ruff Carrigan, the player manager who became player manager for the Red Sox. He stood at 5'7", 170 pounds, but he beat the crap out of Trish Speaker. And I like to think that he made the blow for diversity, at least in my own mind. Now, he was named uh, manager in 1913. Uh, the team was not doing well, so um, McAleer, the owner, decided, well, what do I have to lose? I'll put Kerrigan in there to uh, replace Stahl. And Stahl went back to his business career in banking. Now, a few words about Mr. Kerrigan. He was known to be, uh, was called rough for a reason. Um, he was relentless behind the plate. He had this pile-driving approach to it. And the story I always like to tell is that you know, one time he was playing Detroit and there was a third baseman who was on the base pads by the name of George Moriarty. And he yelled over to Kerrigan behind the plate, you Iris SOB, I'm going to knock you over. And Kerrigan's response was, well, let's see how it goes. Well, sure enough, Moriarty made it around third base and headed for home. And the collision was made. And who was left standing? Rough Kerrigan. But he didn't stop there. He expectorated a stream of tobacco juice over Moriarty, or I should say on Moriarty. And then he leaned over and said, how do you like that, you Irish SOB? And you know, that's the kind of personality he had. But given kind of the roughhouse nature of the game, and given the personalities, the difficult personalities on these early Red Sox teams, he was tailor-made to manage them. Because they might not like his religion or his ethnicity, but you know what? They respected him or else there would be consequences. And I should add, he was an expert boxer, which was a good quality to have back then if you were a baseball manager. <laughs> and he is, uh, well, he is the most successful Red Sox manager of all time. He is the only manager to claim back-to-back -back World Series titles, 1915 and 1916. And helping him attain these back-to-back -back titles was this man, Joseph Lannan. And he also, I think, is uh, one of those figures lost in the mists of history. He was an extremely important figure to the early Red Sox. And he was the one that helped, along with Kerrigan, engineer, put together the teams that won in 1915 and 1916. He hails from Quebec, Canada. He came here basically working as a bellhop and an office boy, and later moved to New York where he made a fortune in the real estate market. And when McAleer got rid of uh, Jake Stahl as manager, well, this upset Ban Johnson, because Ban Johnson and Stahl were really good pals. And Johnson used all his influence among uh, baseball executives to have uh, McAleer removed as owner of the Red Sox. And he basically set up a deal to have Lannan take over. And Lannan, 
he was a very shrewd, shrewd businessman. And he took no guff. And he stood up to players, especially when it came down to salaries. And he had an epic brawl with uh, Tris Speaker when it came to salaries that changed the course of not only the Red Sox history, but baseball history. And we'll talk about that in just a moment. But among the people that Joseph Lannon brought to those 1915 and 16 teams was a young pitcher from Baltimore by the name of George Herman Babe Roof. And Babe Roof is, without question, the greatest uh, pitcher in Red Sox history. And I, I'm well aware of Roger Clemens and Cy Young, but he put up some amazing stats. And he was purchased by Lannon from the Baltimore Orioles, who basically played in a league that was a notch below the uh, American and National Leagues, called the International Leagues. Now, Roof, how shall I say it, he liked to have a good time as well. And um, he had a very rough beginning. He, uh, his parents owned a saloon near the dock section of uh, Baltimore. And as Roof later put it, I, don't, I not, not only lived above a bar, I lived in the bar and was brought up there. And he met longshoremen, crooked cops, the, you know, kind of the dregs of society. And he said, I became a bum as a kid. His parents were so fed up with him, they sent him to a nearby Catholic reform school. And there he hooked up with a brother, Brother Matthias, uh, a cleric who took a major interest in his athletic ability and taught him the fundamentals of the game. And this caught the attention of the local Baltimore Orioles owner who then purchased his contract and Lannon then contacted the Orioles owner to bring him to the Red Sox in 1914. And he made an immediate you know, splash with the Red Sox. He won, um, I believe, over 15 games on the 1915 World Champions, but 1916 was his banner year. He won uh, 23 games. He pitched, I believe, in 300 innings. And he had an ERA of 1.96, so he allowed less than two runs a game. And in head-to-head -head competition with the great Walter Johnson, arguably the greatest pitcher of all time, he was 5-0. And in the World Series of 1916 and 1918, he put together a streak that was not matched until Whitey Ford broke it in 1962. He pitched 29 and two-thirds scoreless innings. Talk about pitching in the clutch. Well, Babe Ruth could do it all. And he was, if he had not become an outfielder, the greatest outfielder of all time, he would have uh, been the greatest left-hander of all time, in my opinion. But just look at this photo of him. Look at his legs. Look at how skinny he is. We're all used to you know, the big Bambino. Look at him. He, he looks pretty athletic there. Looks like he can do some running. Now, you might ask the question, well, how is it then, given the fact that he was such a great pitcher, why did he, why for God's sakes did he become an outfielder and an everyday player? You know, pitching once every four or five days, that seems like a pretty good racket, right? Get paid pretty well? Sure, why not? Well, the reason had to do with this man. Dun, 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 Tris Speaker. And we talked about Mr. Speaker, um, kind of a, a tough sort. And he got into a salary dispute with um, Joe Lannon. And basically, it got pretty bad. And just before the season opener of 1916, uh, Lannon decided to get rid of Speaker altogether. And he traded him, really sold him to the Cleveland Indians for a bunch of cash and a player. And ever since that trade then, in, um, after 1916, the Red Sox were always kind of a little short in offense. You know, it's hard to replace a lifetime 344 hitter. So what do you do? Well, Babe Ruth decided, well, you know what? I'm available. You know, I, I can um, be an everyday player when I'm not pitching. Why don't we try that? And his managers were kind of dubious about it. But in 1918, which was the war season, the Red Sox were pretty much cut down in terms of the number of quality of players they could field on their roster. I think the Red Sox had the most players in um, uniform during World War I that year. Was, I think it was 11 players. So that's a good chunk of your roster. And 
basically, Roof decided, you know, wore down his manager and said, put me in, coach. And that's what happened. And he batted an even 300 and had, I believe, 66 RBIs and just 300 at bats. And he also pitched uh, in the World Series and earned two victories in the 1918 World Series, the last year of the Red Sox dynasty. And in 1919, Roof decided, well, I really kind of like hitting. And pitching's kind of boring, you know, once every five days. Why don't you put me in full time? Let me just kind of put aside pitching, because to pitch and to be an everyday player, you know, I'm too exhausted. And the Red Sox management held back because, you know, he was such a great pitcher. You know, they didn't want to give up that advantage. But the Red Sox got out of the uh, pen of contention early in 1919. And they decided, oh, why not? Let's throw him in. He's been nagging us. Let's make him an everyday player. And watch, he'll probably tire of it, or he won't do as well as he thinks, and he'll go back to pitching. Well, he didn't go back to pitching because he was even better in 1919 than he was in 1918. In fact, he set a new home run record for the time, 29 home runs. And now it doesn't seem like a big deal, but in the dead ball era, that was a huge amount of home runs. And so this established Babe Ruth as a national figure. He was a national sports hero. And you'd think, well, given that status, he was going to be around for the Red Sox for a very long time. But alas, who shows up on the scene? Well, Harry Frazee, yes. And he hailed from Illinois, and he was a theater entrepreneur, a magnet. And he hit it big. His first musical comedy was Madame Cherie. And he was something of a gambler. And he took over the Red Sox is basically to expand his entertainment portfolio. And he said, you know, basically, my job in life is to amuse people, to get people to have a good time. Because he, as he said it, if you read a newspaper, there's too many Undertaker's announcements. Let's have fun. Let's, you know, go to the theater. Let's go to the ballpark. And that's how he got involved in baseball. He thought it would be a neat idea with his theater enterprises and operations to expand here a real entertainment mogul. And things worked out quite well at first. Uh, the Red Sox, under his guidance, uh, won the 1918 uh, American League pennant and went on to beat the Chicago Cubs in six games for their uh, fourth championship in seven years. But after 1918, Frizee got into some financial difficulties. And the the person that put him in that financial difficulty was our old friend Joseph Lannon. Because Lannon had sold the Red Sox to Harry Frizee. And Frizee still owed Mr. Lannon a $250,000 note. And Lannon pressed him on it in the 1919 offseason. He said, give me my money. And Frizee, because he had theatrical enterprises spread out all around, he wasn't exactly liquid. Well, where am I going to get the money to pay off Lynn? He's really on my back. Well, what's my most valuable asset? Babe Ruth. And he had a willing customer in the New York Yankees who were now owned by this man, Jacob Rupert on the right. And he owned a beer company, appropriately enough, beer and baseball. Can't get better than that. And he was also good friends with Frizee. And he said, you know what? Um, I can help you out. I can, I can definitely help you out there. And so he floated him a $300,000 loan and sold Roof for over $100,000 directly to the Yankees. And there was no players exchanged here. And Roof became then the cornerstone for the New York Yankees dynasty. Under Roof, they won four their first four World Series championships. And really, when you think about it, I know Frizee gets the knock for selling Roof, but who really set the ball into motion here that forced Frizee's hand, well, it was Lannon. And why did Lannon force his hand? Well, who knows at that particular point. But it's also important to realize that Lannon was the one who basically is responsible for making Babe Roof into an everyday player. Because if he had not traded Tris Speaker 
Babe Ruth would have remained a pitcher. So Lannon is incredibly important to the history, not only of the Red Sox, but the history of baseball. And he traded two of the greatest players of all time, Trish Speaker, and is responsible for the trade of Babe Ruth. Now Babe Ruth, and this is one of my favorite shots of him, at ease, he became more than a baseball player, frankly. In the 1920s and the 1930s, he became bigger than Michael Jordan could ever wish to be these days. He became a cultural icon, really the first cultural icon in sports. And the fans absolutely adored him. And this shot is at Fenway Park. I think it's sometime in the 1920s. And he was still a fan favorite in Boston. They did not blame him for the trade. And whenever he'd come here, the kids would flock to him asking for autographs. And he was very good with the fans, especially the kids. But I think his status as an icon was cemented in 1921 when he was invited to the White House. And this was a time, period of time when, you know, the President of the United States is inviting a ball player to the White House. That's like, I don't know, uh, President Obama inviting Lady Gaga for the inaugural, right? So this, I think, helped make Roof into a major, major figure. And Roof, of course, um, his life was cut short. He developed throat cancer in 1946, and he died in 1948. And I just want to read you, just to conclude here, um, a quote from the then baseball commissioner at the time of Roof's death, Happy Chandler. And this is what he had to say about Roof. While his bat is forever stilled, the mighty Bambino will not be forgotten as long as baseball endures, he eulogized. And indeed, Roof was destined to live on in active memory, just like the great Red Sox teams from the sun-drenched days of his youth, 1912 to 1918. And I'm all done. I hope I made sense. Thank you.